I ask you to take your Bible now and turn with me to the book of James, chapter 1. James, chapter 1. And we'll be reading verses 5 through 8. James, chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. James, chapter 1, verse 5. James writes and says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given to him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now call your attention back to verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally. I want to talk to you tonight about the liberal giver. Now let's pray. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you that we have the opportunity to get together here. We have the opportunity to share prayer requests, and we'll have a season of prayer. And then, Lord, we take time to study your word, to learn, to grow thereby. And, Lord, give us direction by your spirit. Guide us into all truth. Lord, we cannot properly understand your word without you. Once again, Father, touch each soul according to their spiritual need. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. I want to give a little definition of turn. We're talking about wisdom tonight. And what is wisdom? Wisdom is not knowledge. Knowledge and wisdom are two different things. Knowledge is simply the accumulation of information. And if you have a good memory, you can acquire a great deal of knowledge. And I've known some people in my lifetime had incredible memories, just tremendous memories. I, I could give you many examples. Let me give you just one that you'll, you'll relate to. Pastor Chris Lewis, when he was just, uh, I think, in the first, maybe the second grade, uh, might have been second grade, uh, his mother called. They used to live right off of Linton and... Congress over here in an apartment complex. His mother called me one morning early and said that he had missed the school bus and could I come and take him to school. I said sure. Went over there to the apartment, picked up little Chris, I think about second grade. He got in the car and he said, now you're going to pull out the driveway here. You're going to take a left onto Linton Boulevard. You're going to go through the light. You're going to get on I-95. You're going to go north. You're going to get off at Gateway Boulevard. You're going to go right. And then you're going to take a left, and he named the street. I don't remember the name of it. And then you're going to take another left, and you'll be at the school. And I thought, how does this little boy know that? But he did. He did. I mean, he was exactly right. I used to call him the human map. <laughs> you know? uh, he could told me turn by turn. Again, no more than a second grader. I've known some people with incredible memories. I cannot remember the name of those two streets the last two turns right now. But he did. Another one was Dr. Monroe Parker. Dr. Monroe Parker had a memory that, that was just amazing. Uh, we were gathering a group of us up in uh, Ocoee, Florida, uh, for a very special time of prayer. And Dr. Parker flew in, and we picked him up at the Orlando airport. Now, I'd called ahead to the pastor of the church where we were going. And he gave me directions to get to the church. There was no map quest or no GPS or anything like that in these days. We didn't have any cell phones. And this was in 1986. Now, that's important. You remember that, 1986. And so we picked up Dr. Parker at the Orlando airport. I got on the turnpike, headed north to Okoye, got off at the exit for Okoye, and I made a left turn. Dr. Parker was sitting in the front seat beside me. I was driving. He says, Brother McClure, I believe you should have turned right. I said, well, sir, maybe so, but I, I got directions from the pastor. He said to get off the turnpike and turn left. This was 1986. Remember that. Dr. Parker said, I preached at that church in 1959, and I believe you should have turned right. He was correct. Now, from 1959 to 1986, he remembered how to get to that church. I can't remember even the name of the church now, how to get there. It's somewhere in Okoe. 
Another one, Dr. Aubrey Martin. Dr. Aubrey Martin was blinded when he was 14 years old. He not only finished high school, he finished college, he went through seminary and got the second highest grade average in the history of that seminary. I've seen him stand in a pulpit like we are, right, like I am right now, and expound a chapter of the Bible. And if he was looking at James chapter 1, he would tell you that in first verse 1 it says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are in scattered abroad greeting and he would expound on that then he would drop down to verse 12 say look at verse 12 it says blessed is the man that endureth temptation and when he is tried he shall receive the crown of life and the Lord hath promised to them which the Lord hath promised to them that love him now I want you to go to verse 14 but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and entice but if you'll go back to verse 4 but let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire wanting nothing now that's not the chapter he did the verse but I'm telling you how he worked his way up and down through the chapter like that I was sitting one day as he was standing at the pulpit I was sitting in a balcony it would have been up over here and I could see the pulpit you know what was on the pulpit in front of him nothing no Bible, no notes, no Braille. It was all in here. All in here. I've known several men who memorized the entire New Testament because they were losing their eyesight and they knew the time was coming. They wouldn't be able to read it. And they memorized the entire New Testament. You could give a, any verse reference in the New Testament, they'd tell you exactly what it said. Some people have a great, great memory. And really, all you need to gain knowledge is a good memory. I talked to a pediatrician on one occasion. And we were having a discussion, and he said, what you really need to be a doctor, to be a physician, is a good memory. He said, because you cannot afford to forget anything. I think you all appreciate that. So if you have good memory or if you can retain facts, you can retain information, you have knowledge. And if you can retain facts and information, if you can remember what you've read and what you've heard, you'll score well in school. You'll do well on tests. You'll score well in school. You'll do well. But that's knowledge. That's not wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to rightly apply the knowledge that you have. Wisdom is the ability to discern and make proper decisions, make the right choices. Wisdom is knowing what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad, what's better and what's best. So wisdom and knowledge are not the same thing. They're close together. It's wonderful if you find a person who has both knowledge and wisdom. Now I'm going to contrast what I just told you with some other people I've known. I've known some people who never finished high school, but they had more wisdom than people I've known with a graduate degree. They had a tremendous amount of wisdom, and they could see things, they could analyze things, they could figure things out, they could tell you the best way to do things. They weren't as highly educated as some folks I've known, but they had wisdom. I've known some people who were highly educated who had wisdom, of course, but I've known some people who were highly educated who didn't seem to have any wisdom. Now, I do not know that this is true, so don't take it to be fact, but I've heard it said more than once that Albert Einstein couldn't remember to tie his shoes. I don't know if that's a fact. That's what I've heard. Is that possible? It's possible. It, again, I, I don't know it to be fact. What I'm trying to tell you is there's a difference in wisdom and knowledge. And we're talking tonight not about knowledge, but about wisdom. It's good to have knowledge. It's useful to have knowledge. But you need to have wisdom. I need to have wisdom. You need to have wisdom. The other word I want to define is the word liberal. I, my title tonight is the liberal giver. And as soon as I say liberal... 
Just the fact that I use that word, some people's minds are going to immediately jump into the region of political conflict. And let me assure you, I'm not going to talk about political conflict tonight. You want to talk about political conflict, see me after the service and we can talk about it. But I'm not here to talk about that. I have had a few folks, not many, but I've had a few folks kind of complain that I don't, I'm not more political in the pulpit. I can give you a very quick and sound reason why not. That's not what the pulpit's for. The pulpit is not for me to preach politics. The pulpit is for me to preach the Word of God. You get the Word of God right, your politics are going to be right. You get the wisdom that God has to give, your politics are going to be right. You let God guide you, your politics will be right. My job in the pulpit is to preach the Word. Now, say, well, don't you care about what goes on in the government, I care very much about what goes on in the government. It's not what the pulpit is for. You don't have opinions and ideas, I do. Be glad to share them with you. It's not what the pulpit is for. Well, some people said, I'll just go somewhere else where they preach politics. Well, you go where they preach politics, I'm going to preach the word. So liberal here has nothing to do with politics. But in order to present, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be talking about God tonight. In order to talk about God in the way that the inspired text that we're looking at, James 1, 5 through 8, it is necessary for me to define the word liberal. So I'm going to give you two sets of definitions, not two definitions, two sets of definitions. First set. Is from Merriam-Webster's online dictionary, which defines the English word liberal as, number one, a, of or relating to or based on the liberal arts, liberal education. B, an archaic meaning of or befitting a man of free birth. Number two, a, marked by generosity, open-handed, a liberal giver. B, given or provided in a generous and open-handed way. That is the de definition we're concerned with tonight. So let me read that one again. A marked, uh, marked by generosity, open-handed, a liberal giver, given or provided in a generous and open-handed way. To see, ample, full. Number three, an obsolete definition, lacking moral restraint, licentious. Now, if you get to that definition they're calling obsolete, lacking moral restraint, licentious, that really fits more the political realm uh, of the definition of liberal. Then number four, uh, not literal or strict, loose, a liberal translation. Again, that would fit more the political idea. Number five, broad-minded, especially not bound by authoritarianism, orthodoxy, or traditional forms. And again, that fits more the political realm. That's the English definition, the definition of the English word. The definition of the Greek word translated liberally in this verse means simply generously. Generously. The Lord giveth to all men generously. So that's in keeping with the English definition that was given or provided in a generous way. So when we're talking about giving liberally, we're talking about giving generously. And generously means to give in abundance. Give more than you even ask for, and we'll show you that in just a, a moment or two. But now look at verse 5. Let's examine verses 5 through 8. Verse 5 says, if any of you lack wisdom... Now, I, I'm going to speak for myself and only myself, but I lack wisdom. I know some of you sitting there saying, we knew that already. But, but the truth of the matter is, I do lack wisdom. Don't you have any wisdom? I think I have some, but I never have enough. Always need more. Always need more. Do you ever pray for wisdom? Every day. Every day I pray for wisdom. Why? Because I need wisdom every day. I make decisions every day, decisions that not only affect me, but affect other people. I need wisdom. I need to make the right choices. I need to take the right action. I need to do the right thing. I need wisdom. 
And so it says if anyone lack wisdom, by the way, if anybody else, if I'm not the only one in the room, if anybody else here needs wisdom, this is going to help you also. Quite often when somebody asks me, how can we pray for you? And I, was, I could give you a long list of things to pray for me about, but you know what? You could give me probably at least as long a list, maybe longer, to pray for you about. But all, quite often, not always, but quite often when somebody asks me how can they pray for me, I say pray for me to have wisdom. Again, yeah, I need it. I need wisdom. I'm not overloaded with it. I need more. So what are we supposed to do if we lack wisdom? Well, the Bible tells us right here what to do if we lack wisdom. Verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. So what are we supposed to do if we lack wisdom? We're supposed to go to God and ask Him for wisdom. Is there any biblical example of anybody who went to Him and asked for wisdom? Yes. And we'll get to that here momentarily also. But it says, let Him ask of God. When I lack wisdom, I'm instructed to go to God, go to the Lord, and ask Him for the wisdom that I need. And as you or I ask God for wisdom... Know that God giveth to all men liberally, generously. And then the next phrase says, he upbraideth not. God does not dishonor us when we pray and ask for wisdom. He does not scold us for asking for wisdom. What does he do? He gives to us liberally, generously, that which, for which we ask. He gives us the wisdom that we need. Notice the prayer promise here. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given unto him. That's a prayer promise. The prayer promise is if you go to the Lord and you ask for wisdom, he's going to give you wisdom. Now a little something I do, and you don't have to do it. You don't need to follow my example. And I didn't, this is not original with me. I got it from another preacher, but um, I go through the Bible, and every time I find a verse that talks about the return of the Lord, that the Lord Jesus is coming back, in the margin next to that verse, I put a little SC. What does that mean? That means that verse talks about the second, summing, second coming, the second coming of Christ, a little SC, second coming. Whenever I find a prayer promise in the Bible, I put in the margin by it, a little P, P, two P's, prayer promise. And that helps me to find these things when I'm looking through my Bible again, find second coming verses, find verses that are prayer promises. Now, you don't have to do that. You may think, well, I, I don't think I want to do that. Some people don't like to write in their Bible, and that's fine. Some people think that's not the proper thing to do, and if that's your point of view, that's fine. No, no trouble there. We won't argue about it. But it helps me in studying the Bible. So God has promised that if you need wisdom, if you lack or do not have wisdom, you ask him for wisdom and it shall be given unto you. That is a promise. There is a condition to that promise. If you need wisdom, pray to God, ask him for wisdom, he'll give you wisdom. And God is the one that giveth to all men liberally. What does it mean that he's going to give to you liberally? He's going to give you more than enough. Paul in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 writes this. Now to, unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. What is the power that worketh in us? That's the power of the Holy Spirit in us. It's the power of God in us. And according to the power that works in us, the Lord is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask and all that we think. He'll do things for you you never even thought of. Well, preacher, you ever had him do things for you you didn't think of? Yes. Things that never occurred to me. God can and will give you more than you ask for and more than you think. 
He gives to all men liberally. Now, at this point, somebody's likely to be thinking, does that mean that I get anything and everything I pray for, anything and everything I ask God for? And there's a simple answer to that, and the answer is no. It does not mean that. Well, you just said God wants to answer our prayers. I did, but he's not going to give you everything you pray for. Well, why not? Well, there are several reasons, but I'm just going to give you two. Well, how do you know? How do you know God's not going to give me everything I ask for? Well, I read the Bible. You're in James chapter 1. Turn over to James chapter 4. I could read this to you, but I want you to read it. James chapter 4 and verse 2. James says, you lust and have not, you kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain, you fight and war, yet you have not because ye ask not. So you don't get things sometimes simply because you haven't asked God. You don't get the wisdom you need, you don't get other things you need sometimes because you haven't asked God. But now look at verse 4. You ask and receive not. You don't have because you haven't asked, but sometimes you're going to ask and not get it. Why not? You ask and receive not because you ask amiss. What does that mean? It means you're asking for the wrong thing. What you're asking for is not in accordance with God's will. I never have, and I, I don't think I ever will. I cannot not imagine the emergency so dire that would cause me to do this. I've never prayed and said, Lord, help me win the lottery. I'll tell you what has happened. I've had numerous people... I don't mean hundreds, but I mean uh, probably a couple of dozen people say to me over the years, well, if I win the lottery, I'm going to give generously to the church. Hasn't happened yet. You mean the people didn't win the lottery? Well, most of the time, that's right. They didn't win the lottery. I told you about one fellow I met, though, said he won the lottery twice. Did he give generously to the church? Not that I know of. And by the way, let me help you understand that. If you're giving to the church, I good chance I don't know what you give or what you don't give because I don't see it. What I do see is the total amount that comes in. And looking at the total amount that comes in, I'm pretty sure nobody who ever won the lottery gave generously to the church. I think that makes sense to you. What I am trying to get across to you is this. James is saying in James 4 verse 3, You ask and receive not because you ask amiss. And why do you ask for the wrong thing? That you may consume it upon your lust. You ask for something you shouldn't have in the first place. You know you shouldn't have it in the first place. And God's not going to answer your prayer. He's not going to give it to you. But let me give you another verse. A couple of verses. This is 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. Listen carefully. 1 John chapter 5, 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have in him... If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions we desired of him. That's another prayer promise. There's a condition to that prayer promise. I told you there's a condition to the one in, in chapter 1. I haven't given you that condition yet, but it's coming up. Again, 1 John 5, 14, 15. This is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. He's listening. And we know that he hears us. Whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions we desire of him. If we do what? Ask anything according to his will. What James 4, 3 is telling us is sometimes we ask for things that aren't his will. But 1 John 5, 14, 15 tell us if we ask for anything according to his will, we're going to receive it. Now, let's go back to James chapter 1. And it says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. It shall be given unto him. But again, that's a conditional prayer promise. You still haven't given us the condition. I'm, I'm keeping track of that. In 1 Kings chapter 3, you don't need to turn there. 1 Kings chapter 3, we have a beautiful example 
of what James is telling us when he instructs us to pray for wisdom. You're familiar with the story, so I'm going to go through it quickly. In 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 1, it says, In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. That's not the only time in the Bible the Lord said to a king, Ask what I shall give thee. He asked in Isaiah 7, he asked the king there, not Solomon, he asked the king there, Ask me for a sign. I'll give you a sign. That king said, I won't ask. I'm not going to ask. Well, Solomon wasn't like that. The Lord told him, ask what I shall give thee. 2 Kings 3, verse 1. And in verse 9, Solomon asked. The Lord said, ask what, what you want. I'll give it to you. Verse 9, Solomon prayed, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad. That is wisdom. An understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern, see, analyze, understand the difference between good and bad. For who is able to judge this so great people? We skip verse 10 and verse 11 through 14. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgments, behold, I have done according to thy words. What does that mean? Behold, I have done according to thy words. I'm, I've answered your prayer. He didn't say, I'm going to answer your prayer. He said, I've already answered it. Already answered your prayer. But he didn't stop there. He said, Lo, I have given thee, have, already, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither, shall, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. What is he saying? Solomon became the wisest man who ever lived. Now, if you know the story of Solomon, you're going to know that the wisest man who ever lived made some serious mistakes. If the wisest man who ever lived made some serious mistakes, what am I going to do? I'm going to make mistakes. Isn't it wonderful that God is gracious? The Lord's not finished. He said, I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee in all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did walk, then will I lengthen thy days. You know what the Lord is saying there? He's saying, if you obey me, you follow me, you walk according to my word, not only am I going to give you the riches and honor that you didn't ask for, but I'm going to give you more days to live. I'm going to lengthen your days. I've told you before, there are things you can do that will lengthen your life or shorten your life. Solomon was promised that if he followed the Lord's will, the Lord would lengthen his days, give him more time. But not only will the Lord answer a prayer that is offered, but he tells us to pray in faith. Look at the next verse, verse 6. But let him ask in faith. That's the condition to the prayer promise of verse 5. You've got to ask in faith. Back in verse 5, he said, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth all men liberally and upbraideth not. Upbraideth not. He's not going to upbraid us. He's not going to shame us. He's not going to scold us. If you pray for wisdom, God has promised to answer you. But the condition is to pray in faith, nothing wavering. What does that mean? It means to absolutely trust the Lord to answer your prayer. To give you that wisdom that you need. He that wavereth, James goes on, excuse me, James goes on to say, is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Which way is that wave going to go? Whichever way the wind blows. You know there's some people like that. Which way do they go? Whichever the way the wind's blowing at the time. I knew a man years ago. He was sat in these pews years ago. 
And he had a winning personality. He had a nice smile. He had a winning personality. Most people that met him liked him. But I noticed something about that man. He would learn a little bit about you. He didn't know all about you, but he'd learn a little bit about you. And whenever he talked to you, he would tell you what he knew you wanted to hear, whether it was true or not. He knew what you wanted to hear. He knew what you liked and what you didn't like, and so that's how he would talk to you. He would tell you what he wanted to hear. Some years later, I got a call from a church in another city, and that church was thinking about calling that man as pastor. I said to the man who called me, I said, I can't recommend him to you. He said, why not? Seems to be a good guy. I said, I know he seems to be a good guy, but I'm telling you, he'll tell you what you want to hear. And if he thinks what you want to hear changes, then he'll change what he tells you. That's not being honest, folks. It's not being honest. It might be being a good salesman, but it's not being honest. That's what James is talking about. He that wavereth, not in what he tells people, but he that wavers in his faith. He that blows with the wind, whichever way the wind is blowing. So we must ask in prayer... And we must pray with faith. Matthew 13, 54 to 58 speaks of the Lord Jesus returning to Nazareth. He had gone out. He had begun his public ministry. And his fame had preceding it, preceded him back home as he was coming back home to Nazareth. They had heard about him. They had heard about miracles that he had done. They had heard about his preaching and teaching. But when he was teaching in Nazareth, here's what the people said. Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Where does he get these things from? They said, we know him. We know who he is. Whence hath this man these wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Don't we know his daddy? Isn't that old Joseph the carpenter? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas... And they were offended in him. Isn't that something? They were offended in him. Why? Because they knew him growing up. Where does he get off teaching like a master teacher? Where does he get off doing miracles and things? Who does he think he is? Well, the fact is, it's not who he thought he was, who he knew he was. He was doing exactly what he came to do. But the end of that chapter, the last verse... Matthew 13, 58 says this, And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now, don't miss this. Jesus wasn't limited in what he could do because of their unbelief. He was limited in what he would do because of their unbelief. Suppose somebody came to you and said, uh, I need some help. Would you help me out? And you said, sure. What kind of help do you need? He says, well, I really need you to loan me $50. And you said, okay, I'll loan you $50. And you said, no, you won't. I don't believe it. How inclined do you feel <laughs> to give them the $50? I mean, they just doubted you. And you say, no, I mean it. I'm serious. I'm going to give you the... No, you won't. I know you're just saying that. I don't believe you. I don't believe you for a second. Are you going to give them the 50 Well, some of you might. But why should God give me what I pray for if I don't believe him? If I don't think that he's going to give me what I ask for, why should he give it to me? Well, don't you think the Lord's so gracious he might give it to you anyway? He might. Just like you might be kind hearted enough to give it to the fool, I mean to the fellow who said, uh, I don't believe you. But God hasn't promised to do that. He hasn't promised to give you things that you ask for and that you don't trust him to give you. He has promised to give you what you ask for in faith. There's an old story about that. I believe it happened up in Tennessee. And a lady lived in a little place right at the foot of a mountain. And she had read in the Bible where the Lord Jesus said, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you say to this mountain, Be thou plucked up, be thou cast in the sea. And she said, I'm going, to, I'm going to pray for that mountain to be moved. The mountain was right behind her house. She lived right at the foot of it. She prayed, and she prayed all night long for the Lord to move the mountain. 
After she prayed all night long, the sun came up. She saw the sunlight coming in through the window. She got up, walked out to her back door, opened it up, and looked it out and said, just like I thought, it's still there. What does that story teach you? Well, she was praying, but she wasn't believing. Well, do you think God would honestly move that mountain? Now, now that's a tricky one, isn't it? The Lord said he would. Which of us has enough faith to believe the mountain will move? Say, well, come on, preacher. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> We're all going to say, well, come on. The mountain going to move? The Lord said he would. But I, I, I just can't believe that, and that's why it's not going to move. The Lord tells us here through James that if you ask for wisdom, the Lord's going to give you wisdom, but ask him in faith. Believe him and trust him to give you that wisdom. We must pray, pray in faith. Matthew 21, verse 22, Jesus said, And all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. He did not say all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, you shall believe, uh, you shall receive. He did not say all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, you shall receive. He said all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. Verse 7, for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. What man shouldn't think that he's going to get anything from the Lord? The man who doesn't ask in faith, who wavers like the wind blowing a sea wave around. The man who doesn't ask believing. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. And then finally, verse 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. The term double-minded here is a translation of a Greek term that literally means two-souled. A man of two different souls. Well, does anybody have two souls? Not really. You only have one soul. But the point here is a person who's trying to go two different directions at the same time. You know you can't do that. You can't go right and left at the same time. You can't go east and west at the same time. You can't go north and south at the same time. You've got to go one way or the other. Now, you can go a little bit one way and turn around and go the other way, but you can't do it at the same time. I heard, I heard a musician say one time, he had just finished playing some music, and somebody said, play that again. He said, I can't. They said, what do you mean you can't? You just played it. He said, I can play something that's going to sound very similar to it, but I can't play it again. Once I've played it, that's it. I can't play the exactly same thing again. It's going to be different. You can't go two directions at the same time. You can't go up and down at the same time. A double-minded man is a person who claims to be a Christian but does not fully trust the Lord. Double-minded man is the person who prays to God but places his faith in the world. The double-minded man is the person who prays to God but wants his prayers to be answered according to his own demands. My wife and I were invited to a revival meeting in another church, not terribly far from here, not here in town and not even in the next town, but not, not terribly far away. It was an easy drive there and back. And the fellow who was preaching preached most of his sermon on call it and it will be. And he said this. He said, if you, you got a car you want to sell, he said, you call it sold and it'll be sold. He said, if you want a new Cadillac, you call it yours, it'll be in your carport. And he said, that's faith. No, folks, that's not faith. That's not what God told you to do. You don't name it and claim it. You don't call it yours and it's yours. That's not right. Now, I, I'm going to give this man credit. That night he did give the gospel and he gave a gospel invitation and people were saved. I, I've got to give him credit for that. But the main message wasn't on the gospel. The main message was on calling something and whatever you call it, it's going to be so by the authority of your word. It is not by the authority of your word. It's not by the authority of my word. It's only by the authority of God's word that things are going to be done. I cannot call something and make it 
be what it isn't. The person who prays to God but wants his prayers answered according to his own demands. I demand that God do this. Who are you to demand God to do anything? You ask God and you pray in faith believing and you trust him to do it. That's what the Bible says. He says the double-minded man's unstable in all his ways. Unstable means inconsistent, restless, indecisive in all his ways. In every decision, every aspect of life, he's unstable in all his ways. Let me wrap it up here. Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11, you know it. Jesus said, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. He that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be open. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a serpent? You wouldn't do that. If your son asked for bread, you wouldn't hand him a snake. Here, chew on this a while. You wouldn't do that. What man is there of you, if his son... Whom if his son asked bread, he'd give him a serpent. If ye then being evil, did, did the Lord just call us evil? He did, didn't he? If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good gifts to them that ask him? God wants to hear your prayers. God wants to ask your prayers. You pray and pray in faith believing. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. You and I aren't always going to figure it out. You and I aren't always going to get it. We're not always going to understand it. But we can trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thy understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him. You know what that means? In all your ways, everything you do, make Him known. And He shall direct thy paths he'll lead you he'll give you that wisdom you need he'll answer those prayers don't be double minded our text verse one more time verse 5 if any of you lack wisdom let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally generously abundantly and upbraideth not and it shall be given unto him pray for wisdom trust the Lord to answer your prayer Colossians 4, 5 says, walk in wisdom. Pray, the Lord is the liberal giver. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for this precious promise in your word that when we need wisdom, we can come to you. We can pray. We can trust you to give us that wisdom which we need to make right decisions, to discern right from wrong to understand, to analyze, and to come through with those things that we need to do. Lord, so often we don't know the right path. We don't know the right way to go. We don't know the right decision. Lord, you lead us. We never have enough wisdom, but you do. And we trust you to give us the wisdom that we need. Now, Father, bless us as we go to a season of prayer. Help us, Lord, to pray in faith, believing for these requests that have been given. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.